My name is Tiffany St. James. I'm a digital strategist and I have spent the most part of the last decade in central government launching big technical innovations with citizen engagement. I was the first director of comms for DirectGov, our UK portal and information sharing website with the UK public. I launched data.gov.uk, uh, the government's open data repository and source of open data, and became the first head of public participation, which essentially meant that I was head of social media, but also incorporating co-creation of public policy. So I spent a good 10 years in central government, and I'm so delighted to be invited here by Medea today to share with you, particularly in the environment of what's going on here today in the Connectivity Lab, uh, what the UK government have done uh, and the journey that coders, programmers and hackers have led them to in terms of helping them with their open data provision. And also the work that uh, Reward States, the largest independent developers network, have been doing working with government and public sector and open data to help teach kids to code in the UK. Well, that's a couple of stories that I wanted to be able to share with you. Before I go any further, I'm just checking the sending on my mic. Is that okay? Yeah, good. That works. So um, thank you very much. So we knew um, very early on working in DirectGov that um, mixing together data and open data was an interesting proposition for the UK public. They really wanted to, uh, as external industry had done, to be able to take data, map it together, and have some neat execution. So as early back as sort of 2006, 2007, we were taking data maps and putting them on DirectGov. I was... Uh, uh, identified the first map that became on DirectGov, and it was the blue badge parking bays display. So essentially, in the UK, there's a blue badge, which is for disabled people. And a company had mapped all over the UK where those blue badges were, and we put them together with Google Maps, and we put it on um, DirectGov. It was the first mashup that um, government had ever seen, and it made the news. And we had the minister come in, um, you know, be photographed by local journalists to be able to uh, look at that and display. And that led the way to data being put together in interesting resources. So some of the interesting resources that people found were to be able to find your GPs, your general practitioners, your doctors in the UK. People wanted that execution not just on a government verified site, they wanted it on mobile, they wanted it in their hand, in the street, in the time that they needed to access that. So here's some images that find your GPs, 11,000 of them. It was one of the first kind of data executions we had, or dentists. Or actually pharmacies, you know, late at night they wanted to be able to find out opening hours of pharmacies to be able to get medications. But it wasn't um, until March um, the 7th, 2009, that we created first uh, the National Hack the Government Day. This is a picture of Emma Mulqueenie. She's a digital strategist at the time working in the Home Office. Emma identified that coders, programmers, developers weren't a part of yet the government conversation. So networked as she was, she found a couple of bright developers who um, talked and showed her about what hacking could perhaps do. So Emma got hold of the 100 best developers in the UK that then kind of whittled down to about a core 80 people. And she wanted to be able to create a hack day with no money, no volunteers, outside of a full-time job in central government. So she went to The Guardian. The Guardian, one of our great newspapers that um, had opened up its API and were doing, had a developer's network of their own and were quite interested in coding and programming and hacking. And she banged on their door and she asked them, you know those desks you have, you know? You know when the journalists go home on a Friday? Can we use them over the weekend, please? Um, and they said yes, and they gave us the resources, they gave us their AV and some of their technicians. And they gave us, more importantly, just space and um, plug sockets, and that's what we needed. So Emma got together and got 80 of the best developers in the UK and created National Hack the Government Day on a Saturday. It was just um, a, a working eight hours that we got the developers and coders together, um, and they made 30 working projects within that time. What Emma did, which was quite smart, was get hold of um, digital government uh, officials as well as external journalists. We had um, Wired magazine represented and sat them as the judging panel so that they could see at the end of the day what the uh, hackers and coders had created and to be rest assured that it wasn't public um, personal data that was used so that they could see um, what was being made and what was it of value. 
So um, the winning hack, um, forgive the dodgy photo here, I'm sure it was just taken by uh, a phone in the audience, is Job Centre Pro Plus. Um, the gentleman that you can see very vaguely in this bright light is a gentleman called Harry Metcalf. He was in his late 20s at the time. And he created um, Job Centre Pro Plus. Now, in the UK, we have uh, Job Centre Plus, and it's our national provision of how people find a job in the UK. Harry, in eight hours, had created a site that could interrogate jobs and map them and interrogate them in terms of location and data that didn't currently exist in the government. And he made it in eight hours. When uh, Two years later, when the coalition government came in, um, and David Cameron took a group of coders and developers and programmers over to Bangalore on one of his first trips. He took um, Harry with him as part of that entourage. Another group uh, made uh, a way of being able to interrogate uh, companies' house data, which is where all the limited companies put the resources, to match that with which um, organizations have received government's contracts. And they called it open, um, open Companies House and made a great deal of progress on that kind of working prototype and execution to be able to match who had received kind of government grants, government funding, government contracts um, against a limited company as a resource. Another group of three people produced a site in eight hours that was a better execution than government currently had that government had spent five million pounds on. Um, and I think... <laughs> When uh, government officials saw this, that wasn't the only leverage in open data. There'd been, as I presented to the Scanner region, um, you know, earlier, just this month, there was uh, 10 years of kind of leverage and policy and reports around why open data is a great thing. And there was already steps towards that in government, as I've shown. But I think harnessing the power of developers and coders and showcasing that to government was something that government had never seen before. So that's what happened. So shortly after that, we uh, launched uh, data.gov.uk based on data.gov, which is the US model, but actually using linked data. We had the great pleasure to engage and work with Sir Tim Berners-Lee and Professor Nigel Shadbolt, who's head of artificial intelligence in the UK, based at Southampton University, and a core project team um, that uh, worked with us to look at how we could do data flushing and how we get information out of government. And we decided as a team that if we just launched data.gov.uk, that the man in the street wouldn't know necessarily what open data meant. And actually, we had to create some visualizations, we had to create some maps, some attributes to be able to share with them so that someone would understand when we say that open data is a great thing, what that meant, really. So a couple of executions were made. Um, at first off, the traffic accident reports uh, were launched and people mapped them smartly onto a map so that you could see where the cycle accident routes were. And if you were a cyclist, you might take that information and decide to amend your route home because um, of where traffic accident hotspots happen to be for cyclists. So put those together. But one of the fun ways that um, data was used is a postcode newspaper. So to be able to show kind of ministers and senior officials in government what open data meant, we took uh, the data from one particular postcode and produced a newspaper just about all the public sector data in one particular um, area. I've still got some printed copies at home. I should have brought one out with me. But essentially, to be able to demonstrate um, the wealth of data that is available publicly online that's publicly owned within one postcode. So just to produce some light executions to be able to um, then open up the government's data store. And this is what it looks like today. It's gone through several evolutions, um, and uh, the resource that lives on data.gov.uk is all the data sets that government own, the public sector data, all in one place. So some apps that um, I thought it would be useful to share with you in terms of what people have made with that data. Data all in one place, yes, we think it's a good idea, yes, it's public data anyway, but what are the kind of things that people have made with public sector data? Well, we were coming up to a general election. So uh, some smart people took all of the information um, around parliamentary candidates and put them all in one place so that you could enable you to see who were your candidates within your um, locale and make some decisions around the policies and who they were and you know what might affect the way in which that you voted. So a little bit of political things. 
But then some, some other interesting things. So uh, someone invented air text, which is to test the pollution of London air. Some people took public sector data and made compare the care home. So looking at the vast resources of elderly care in the UK and comparing and contrasting the attributes of location as well as uh, level of care, as well as kind of independent research in terms of how viable they were, which we think was a really useful resource. People mapped um, day nurseries. You know, you just moved to a location, you want to put your child in a you know, private day nursery while you're working and they had the opportunity to kind of map and compare all of those. Um, you can't always control what happens with public data when, it, when it's made. So there were some applications that were made um, that, where did my tax go? So you had a kind of the overall government spend and then where tax was kind of broken up um, across different kind of attributes so that people could see where their tax money went. And then some UK climate projections. So these are all applications that the development community made by just looking on data.gov.uk and, and playing with it, if you like. Some uh, uh, progress from uh, 2009 to 2010 is then Reward State started helping government by running independent hack days in departments. So going into, this is Justice and Home Affairs, to be able to go in and just look at justice data and to take all of that data. And we were very lucky, as I mentioned, that we um, engaged Sir Tim Berners-Lee. So when he came over in the country, we um, took him into um, uh, Justice and Home Affairs and into one of the hack days to kind of you know, show him what we were doing and what we were doing with open data uh, within that environment. But I don't think the ministry of Justice or the uh, Department of Home Affairs could really have predicted what happened with their data when it came outside. This is the ASBOrometer. So an ASBO in the UK is an antisocial behaviour order. It's a ticket for being naughty, essentially. And uh, someone took the crime and justice data and made an app which showed you not personal information, because that's not what we're dealing with here, um, but essentially, how many cities had more ASBOs than each other? Um, being able to compare those statistics in a variety of different ways. When it was launched, it was the top UK download for two weeks on the App Store. Um, just grasped the imagination of the public, wanted to know who had, uh, which city was naughtier than others. And then... Um, outside of government, being able to apply hack days to um, company problems as well as company marketing solutions is a something that is a great opportunity for coders and programmers to do. So Honda um, uh, asked Rewired State to come in to look at their statement, which is the power of dreams. And they wanted developers to play with the phrase, the power of minds. Now, actually, it was a looser brief than our developers are used to. Yesterday, um, some of the talks were talking around, we don't, uh, particularly George, I think, from BBC Labs, was talking about we don't want solutions, we want uh, problems and challenges. So developers like a problem to be able to apply the great um, intellect and to be able to work uh, solutions around. So um, working with Honda developers, they created 20 hacks. Um, and, and some of the fun applications that were made were a system to alert drivers to nearby cyclists, an anti-GPS that encourages you to visit new places, and an experiment if you can connect the internet using chicken wire, which we found you can. Um, so organizations are starting to use programmers, developers, and hackers in a couple of different ways. One of which is to you know, create interesting marketing material, as Honda did in this space. Other ways are to work with individual developer teams so that you can get a bit of skills transfer, so that you can look at how um, uh, you can encourage and grow your learning and development uh, capability and capacity. And other things are outside of the remit. So we were approached by uh, Marie Curie, who look after you know, care of the dying, and they had an enormous amount of data, but didn't know how to interrogate it or visualize it. So sometimes real world problems will involve developers and coders to be able to look at the data and say, well, you need to put your resources in Paris and Norwich, for example, because that's um, how we can work with you. Um, an example, not an actual case. Um, so then, conferences have started being able to use coders, developers, and hackers. So Wired approach Rewired State to run, um, I don't think it happened in this year, but it's in talks for later, um, 
if every delegate and participant can bring a piece of data, what new businesses can be made in the back room? And to be able to, as a result of the conference, say, Rolf, you should be speaking to Patricia because what you do and what she does from the data that you brought into the room, you can have a new proposition together. And I think that's a really interesting concept in live events. We were uh, very kindly asked to um, go out to MIP. Now, MIP TV is the largest um, TV conference in the world. 11,000 TV producers um, descend on MIP in March. And for the very first time, the MIP team and Rima Dem put together an event called MIP Cube, which is the technical innovation. So they've got sort of 500, 600 really bright people together. Asta, you want to say something on this, please? Yeah, I just want to say that uh, MIP TV is where I go to get inspired. There's only one other conference in the world, the SFX wow. in uh, California, but that's 20,000 people, so you can't meet anyone, it's too big. But So I go to MIP once a year, that's where all the transmedia and digital geeks go, and then there's all the TV stations. So we're all kind of a, a weird stream uh, with all the TV stations, but we do have some collaboration with them. And this year, the documentaries were there as well. So fiction, documentary, and TV. So it's not the film festival, it's called MIP TV. And it's really, really great uh, yeah. because so many of us come together there from all around the world. We got people from Singapore, Japan. This year, Singapore was looking for partners to come there to uh, do new digital developments. Sure. Thank you. And so It's, um, it's very was, prominent. Yeah. I was very kindly introduced to Asta by um, Jason, who opened yesterday morning at MIP this year. So I only found out at dinner last night that Jason DuPont from The Swarm was responsible for the idea of the hackers being put on a boat. The reason being, as the hack at Connectivity Labs here is today, you need a private space with great connectivity that people can work through the night. And in a conference center that's kind of closely locked down, and not very comfortable environment, um, Reed Medem um, put on, uh, as you can see here, a, a boat, and we called it the boat that hacked TV. And any, um, uh, any uh, reference, any tags, any photography that are on, it's about the Hack TV. Because we needed a space where the hackers and coders could program all night through the night for 36 hours. We took 12 developers out. And the solution that they had, uh, or the challenge that was set to them, was how to make TV more sociable. So this was our office. Not bad, as developers go. And this was um, some of the hackers in progress, working very hard, as you can see, um, hacking and coding through the night. And then um, at the end of the event, we did the kind of show and tell, which you'll hear from later today, which is quite the, the exciting bit of an open hack day to be able to see what people had made. But what I wanted to be able to share with you, it's just a 30 second YouTube video, is actually what was made as the winning hack of the the boat that hacked TV. I'm going to open up can in a separate... Can we turn down the light so we can see uh, the pictures maybe a bit better? <laughs> we yeah, could maybe just close those curtains just a little bit, Esther. But I think these ones up there doesn't help either. We'll hack something where we can turn the sun on and off. Something. <laughs> that one. Oh, it's just that, that direct light there. No, the, um, the, the uh, light on the stand, Esther. Is there well, any way that we can swivel I it? I think that, that has to go to someone who's better than me at lighting. Oh, it's off. Good. Ah, fantastic. I've helped a bit. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see how... We'll see... Uh, so this is just 30 seconds. It's not that clear because it was taken on an iPhone. Um, uh, on the boat as we were preparing for the hacks. But I want to be able to show it to you in context. And I'll reference where it is um, after this. So we'll just see if we can play that for you. Hi, my name is Aral, and this is my hack for the boat that hacked. So you're sitting at home on your sofa, watching television, and something interesting comes on, and you want to share it, say, tweet it. So um, I walk up to my TV, and I just kind of wave at it so it knows I'm there, um, and then when something interesting comes up, I can just grab it, and boom, put it over there. I grab, and boom, I put it over there. So I'm just holding it in my hand, and I'm putting it on my phone, and that's my hack. Um, Aral Balkan's great tech developer, he uh, called that grab of magic, and um, it's uh, part of one of the uh, TED Talent Search talks this year. Uh, but a really interesting hack, um, made with iConnect, um, with uh, content that was available at MIP to be able to make in 36 hours, and that was the winning hack. And we presented that the next day at the opening of MIP TV in one of the grand salons. 
So that's some ways in which that um, hackers, coders, and programmers, you can apply to uh, challenges within industry. One of the really interesting things we found working in um, a TV environment was that there wasn't enough code in a really good shape to make anything decent with. So one of the appeals that we had to programmers and TV makers at the time was to be able to say, look, code and uh, release your data and put it in a, in a great state. Now, radio, interesting enough, interestingly enough in coding, had a lot better data to be able to make listings, to make uh, apps that people interacted or favorited or started booking what they wanted to see. Very little data around in TV to be able to do interesting things with. So one of our uh, appeals to uh, TV. But actually, what I really wanted to be able to share with you is what young coders in the UK have been doing with uh, public sector data. And... Uh, the work that uh, Reword State have been doing in helping the education uh, for kids in coding. So uh, here is uh, here's a bunch of kids, as you can see. So what happened after we ran National Hack the Government Day, there was a large appeal for young people getting involved in, in hacking. Now, there are lots of little sites, groups, forums, discussions of young people coding. And essentially... You know, it isn't taught in formal education. I had a great chat with Patricia yesterday um, in terms of the work that London Knowledge Labs have been doing in getting groups of co kids in schools together um, for coding challenges itself. You know, kids code because they're interested in it. Um, and essentially, there's no formal networks for them. It's not taught in schools. Um, there's not ways in which that they've grown up and they've got professional networks. So one of the things that Young Rewired State started um, was to get kids together for one week in summer and to be able to uh, help them to learn how to code in one week. The challenge is they have to make uh, a mobile app or a website in one week using at least one uh, set of public data. And it's a challenge. We run it in summer. And essentially, we started with a small group. Um, people developed things within sort of local cities and clubs getting together. And what that's now um, uh, transversed into is the Festival of Code. So we have the largest... Um, uh, the largest young hackathon in the UK, we think in Europe, possibly the world. We get 500 kids together. Um, they're supported in 50 different businesses in the UK. And the businesses basically throw open their doors if they've got a developers in there and they understand a bit of development and they've got desk space, essentially. And then independent developers, part of the Reword State Network, give up their week in summer to go and sit in these offices that have kindly given us the plug sockets and the desk spaces. And they take a group of kids from 7 to 18. We kick them out at 18. It's a young Reward State. And um, help them through their own discussions of the things that they want to build, um, help them develop an app in a week. And then we have a big show and tell. Um, now, the show and tell got so big this year that we were very kindly offered Bletchley Park, the home of coding, and then we outgrew it. So we had to go to the custard factory in Birmingham because people needed a sleepover, they're young, some of them needed to be with their parents, some of them needed to be separated in terms of age and rooms. We had one big coding sleepover and a big show and tell. We had five heats in different rooms, and then the top 20 winners were pulled into um, the larger auditorium to present back in front of industry, government, peers... Um, to be able to um, show and tell. And I've got a, a short two and a half minute uh, video at the end of this, but I thought I'd just um, share with you some of the things that have been made in previous years before I do that. Um, so this is Izzy. Um, I've taken her Twitter bio here about herself. Um, Izzy, 16 years old, in previous year of a Young Reward State, built this. It's GovSpark, and it's a way of comparing energy output from different government departments. Um, at 16 years old, she built this during a Young Rewired State competition in 2011. Government didn't have this resource at the time, and they were very excited about it. So they pulled in Izzy into number 10, and they use it. It's still live today. You can still go and see it. Um, and we're delighted to find that our Department for Energy and Climate Change are the best of the table, <laughs> which, would, which you would have hoped, but is in fact the case. So then um, the kids that go through Young Reward State have the opportunity to work on real-world problems in open and independent hacks. This guy is uh, Kevin Long. And Kevin, uh, together with Sam and Craig, joined a hack day 
I think Cameron was about 14 at the time. He joined a hack day for Refugees Reunited. So they came to Rewired State and they said, look, we've got this issue. We've got 55,000 separated families and we want to be able to connect them. What can your hackers do with our information? You know, a lot of them are, are from Kenya. They've been displaced. We've got the details, but we can't match them very well. And this is a real issue and this is what we're involved with. So we ran an open hack day inviting the kids who'd been through Young Rewired State as well as open competition from independent developers who kindly gave us their time. So Kevin and his team redesigned the mobile site to make it more uh, friendly. They allowed text um, and SMS to interact with the data in the Refugees Reunited site and a Facebook app, which hadn't been done before. They also took time to research with families how people identified themselves in a family unit. So in the UK, we might say, your date of birth. Well, you know, that isn't the signifying factor in some of the Kenyan refugee communities. It's about their father's role in the community or who their imam was. Um, so they designed a form together to help people understand, you know, those questions to help with the matching. And um, what was really interesting is... Uh, Kevin and his team won the hack day in terms of the things that they put together at 14 years old against larger independent developers. So I'm going to share with you in the time that we have together sort of the five winning hacks of Young Rewired State um, because I think it's useful for you to see what's been made with public sector data just by young people. But before that, I'm going to just show you it's a five and a half minute video, which I'm going to cut off at two minutes 55, okay? So I'm just going to play with you, which gives you kind of a situation and atmosphere of direct gov, uh, uh, of, um, sorry, of uh, Young Rewired State. independent developer network in the UK. So on Monday morning, the kids come together for a week during their school holidays, and they come into the centres. The centres are set up in different cities, and they're led by independent developers or alumni from Young Rewired State from previous years to help them build a mobile app or a web app in one week that must include at least one piece of open data. I love YRS because 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 it's helped me loads to find people who have the same interests in me and show me cool stuff I can do with coding. And I got to meet loads of different people who like the same things as I did. Coming together to create one thing that you all love and you're all passionate about. The centres and the mentors are really helpful so you learn a lot more than you do when you're at home just coding by yourself. Yep. Yes, next Every year time. I'm hoping to Definitely. Come back. Yeah. Definitely coming back next year. Well, we think it's really good that we're able to make apps that we ourselves would really enjoy because some of the apps on the market, they're, they're good, but they're not amazing. Yeah. Our friends tell us things like, oh, wouldn't it be great to have an app like this? And then we go away and we think, oh, could this actually be possible? Could we do it? Yeah. We made this thing called Bookify. It's like a book recommendations thing, but it also, one of the really cool things is it integrates Amazon reviews and it also links in with your local library. Some of the apps are just so polished that they could be out there right now. There were so many great things to look at, actually, that. Uh, we, we couldn't remember which was the greatest at the end, so we were all looking at our notes, but I think we figured it out. You'll probably meet some really cool people and end up making something really proud of and enjoying the process. I think it's a great opportunity for people. I think they should definitely get involved. You come, you make new friends, you yeah. do the coding, you learn a lot. That's all that's important, really. It's, it turns coding into more of a social thing than a solitary thing. Whether you're seven or you're 17, you can make stuff. It's whether or not you have the resources and the opportunities, and I think that's what Young Rewired State does. It gives people that opportunity. These kids are only taught to cope from self-interest, and through the process of being mentored and getting together, they make those really fundamental relationships that make a fundamental difference to their future and could, from what they build, make a difference to all of ours. There's plenty from me on that video, at least. So... 
Uh, I wanted to be able to share with you some of the things that they made. One of the fun things is, not this year, but last year, we had a nine-year-old stand on stage who looked at the audience of, you know, uh, uh, Jonathan Luff from Number 10 and some journalists and said, well, if government data were in a better state to start with, I would have been able to make more than this game <laughs> to 450 people who absolutely roared. Um, what great uh, way of being able to, not just in the coding principles, I was um, um, talking to... Um, some of the other speakers uh, last night, which is about you know uh, listening to their ideas and um, uh, helping them develop their own ideas and that kind of presentation back, which is absolutely awesome. So, so just the five winners, very kind of briefly. Um, I've just put a screen grab and the link here so that you can see them. But essentially, um, the best example of coding was in postcode wars. So you could put in two independent postcodes and um, essentially look at the amenities that are available in that postcode and then see which one the winner is. What is amenities? Um, so whether they've got good refuse collection, whether the streetlights are broken, whatever public sector data ah. is around what happens in that postcode, whether they've got a hospital, um, whether, how many doctor's surgeries, do they have that kind of data that they look at? So what are the facilities that a local government provision within that postcode? So another of those is why waste a vote? We were coming up to a general election, so it was looking at helping people decide how to vote. There's more information on the uh, hack days around that. Um, one of the most uh, beautiful ex executions, which actually won Best in Show, was Smart Move. In a week, a group of kids developed an app that was elegantly delivered on the, um, on the uh, uh, Apple Store that you could filter data on a postcode um, by a couple of different attributes, or what schools were in there or what house prices, um, so that you could then look at, well, actually, I'm a young family, I'm looking at primary schools, and then you could select that, and you could narrow it down, and then it shows you which houses are for sale within that particular area. So if you're looking to move to a particular area, and it was such a beautiful execution developed in a one week, that's some of the things that um, Aral Balkan was talking around in, you know, the kids are putting things together that um, should be on the market. Um, this app created a new category uh, for Rewired State. Um, number 10 decided that they create a new category called should exist. Um, it was a way of uh, people being able to find their way around who had walking disabilities. So being able to kind of map and understand where there were staircases, where there were routes, where there were great travel opportunities for them. And they created a new category um, to reward the uh, team that built this. And then there was, uh, which I thought of that, um, which was a, a HUMAP, um, which I'm not going to talk about because we're almost out of time. And um, I, I've given the links here to um, not only... So you can talk a little bit about it. Okay, okay. Well, um, in, in terms of... <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, just super conscious that we're overrunning. So uh, uh, HUMAP is a way of... Uh, do you know what? I'm going to pull up the, um, the website so that you can see more details about this. So in here, in terms of, it's a navigation map for humans. And the links that I've given you to the back of the show, um, it's navigation instructions based on points of interest in each step of the journey. So you might be able to uh, look at things that are important to you on your route, whether that's amenities such as Tesco's or whether that's an interesting historic landmark to be able to make your own navigation. There's not that much detail on the hack itself on here, but we've put the links to all of those at the back end of the presentation. So, and that, I think, brings us very neatly to the end. Um, I've put this presentation on SlideShare, and um, I have a TED talk around uh, Young Rewired State, which I'll put the link to here. It's just a four minute if you'd, um, if you'd like it. So I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much, Tiffany. Let's give her a hand. <laughs> And we got time for two questions. Anyone got a question? Yes, Elizabeth Kwan, and we got one here. Hello. Hi there. For a really interesting presentation. Um, first, I have plenty of questions, but I will pick a few. Uh, first, how, how do you recruit all the coders and programmers and developers to the hackathons? Sure. Where do you find them? I mean, how do you, how do you reach out to, to this community? In a variety of ways. I mean, we've been running the program for around three years now. So it's looking at uh, places that originally developers go online and offline. So um, what are the other facilities? We're looking at um, Code Academy, looking at other coding facilities in the UK. So really, just 
getting into networks and some of the face-to-face -face things, so some of the face-to-face -face meetups, some of the developer networks that exist through The Guardian, through Microsoft and through Google, um, through Smart Search on Twitter, and just building up a network. I mean, you know, it's, it's community building at its very best. These guys are all online because they're coding. There's just smart ways to be able to engage with them and to find them. And also, developers know each other. So if you're PHP and you're JSON and you're front end and you're back end, you're going to be able to know an environment of more people. So coders recruit coders. Um, but it, it's hard work and, you know, it's been built up over three years. And uh, <coughs> my second question. Are there many ladies participating? We're delighted that there are ladies participating, yeah. We would have expected it to be uh, predominantly male, more so than it is. Um, I think in the video that we showed you, we showed uh, quite a few of the girls um, uh, showcasing back what they'd made. And that wasn't for any way to show that, oh, there are one or two girls there. I would say it's slightly more boys, but I'd say there's 40% girls. That gets stuck I'm, in. I'm, I'm also thinking about the, the adults. I mean, in the other hackathons that you have been organizing, not only the, the kids' hackathons. Um, that is slightly more biased towards men. There yeah. aren't many. There, there actually are girl geeks and whole n group networks to encourage more girls in the adult coding. It is more men. We have to stop it now, Patricia. Maybe you talk with her, Tiffany in the breaks. Thank you, everybody. And uh, this was the first of our Meet the Creators and the Hackers. We will have more creative and hackers later today. But right now we go to the movement of the Fab Labs, which is an MIT franchise. We are very happy to invite Thomas.